Coaches, welcome to part one of our installation piece here of the power spread offense. We're going to be talking about our offensive philosophy in general here now in this session. Our offensive identity, we're a spread to run football team. That's what we want to do. I'm an offensive lineman myself by, by trade. I played the position my entire life. And so that to me is a big part of who I am and what I want my program to be. We control the football and wear our opponents down with a very aggressive up-tempo, no huddle zone and power read or gap read running game. Uh, we average over 4,000 yards a season from the spread running the football. Uh, that is not one of the, the more heavy package teams or uh, wing T or any of those things. We are a uh, four wide receiver or three receiver and a tight end uh, wing hybrid type player on every single play for the most part and we're averaging over 4,000 yards a season. We are not a spread to throw the ball football team necessarily. Uh, we do like to throw, obviously, uh, and that makes our offense even more dangerous. We average over 2,100 yards a season passing the ball, which really is something that we're looking for here is to take advantage of things in the passing game uh, by being able to run the football effectively and, and getting numbers then on the perimeter. Uh, we like to create explosive plays out there on the outside. In our 92 games the last seven years, we've run the ball 70% of the time. That does include the numbers when our JV or the backups come in if we're well ahead. So that number realistically is probably a lot closer to about uh, 63, 37, somewhere in there when you don't put those late game uh, run the clock out scenarios in there. But overall, we've run the ball uh, 3,682 times the last seven years for over 28,000 yards. And regardless of the play call or who's in the football game, we're averaging over seven and a half yards of carry, which is absolutely tremendous. Again, the whole philosophy here is we want to run the football and establish that, that inside running game especially. So what we do here, like I said, we are, are, are going to establish that inside zone gap power read system. And we're going to do that exclusively through the shotgun. The only time that we go under center is for uh, a victory though I believe they've changed the rules now where you can spike the ball from shotgun in this upcoming season here. Uh, the only time that we ever get under center is for our clock scenarios or for victory. We're an up-tempo team. Uh, the last few years, Indiana actually was one of the pilot states here in the United States that went to the 42nd game clock. It has been, my opinion has been great for us. I know now all states are adopting that here. We previously were the old 25 second clock uh, the 40 second clock really has been something unique for us. It's really allowed us to control the game in a lot of different ways and, and at times even move faster because that ball, as soon as that, that last play is over with and blown dead, the ball now is going to be spotted quickly and that 40 second clock is going to roll and you really have the ability to get yourself up there quickly as opposed to previously when the clock didn't start until the officials had set the ball down, kind of hovered over it. Um, really slowed the pace of the game down at times with that. With the 40 second clock now, their job is to just set the ball while that clock rolls. And, and truthfully, it has allowed us to go even faster at times. There are even a few snaps where we're actually ahead of the first down chains and we're snapping the football before the chains can even reset themselves. So it's been great for us. Obviously, everyone's making the transition now to the 40 second clock anyway. And, and I really think it's something that for those of you who are interested in up-tempo, can really use that to your advantage in a lot of different ways. We run our offense from a lot of different formations, looking for mismatches and obviously the speed at which we line up, uh, looking for the defense to potentially make mistakes. We're trying to force you to adjust to what we do, especially in our running game, and, and use our inside zone play as our identity. And I think that's really important as an offensive coordinator and as a head coach you really want to have something that you can hang your hat on per se that your kids know and your program knows your coaches know the fans know and most importantly your opponents know that this is who they are and this is what we do and we're going to really have to be at our absolute best if we're going to be able to stop them and it doesn't really matter what you choose that play to be. There are some teams out there that are veer systems that maybe their, their bread and butter play is inside or outside veer. Uh, there's wing T teams, maybe your identity play is buck sweep. There's air raid teams and maybe your identity play is, is a double slant and a curl concept on the opposite side. For us, 
we're an inside zone team and that's who we are and that's what we do. Everything then branches off of that. I think it's really important that there's something at the heart of your offense that your kids and you believe in and that there's a comfort zone there where you're going to out execute the opponent on a Friday night in that particular play. Again, maybe it's power, maybe it's counter. It doesn't matter what, what you decide is, is going to be the heart of your offense here. There's really no right or wrong answer. Uh, for us, that's inside zone, and we stick with that. 60% of our offense this year, and that's a very common average for us, was some type of a zone running call. Our play actions and our boots come off of our zone blocking schemes as well. It makes everything very simple for the kids and it continues to feed into that's our identity and who we are as a team and as a program. So the up-tempo aspect of this, we're gonna operate as quickly as possible. We signal everything in from the sideline. Again, there's lots of ways that you can choose to do this, which I'll touch on a little bit later in some of the other series, but we like to signal things from the sideline and we use two signal callers to do so. Uh, normally one of them or both of them can be live. The other one, if it's only one of them, would obviously then be a dead signal caller, but we can use them in tandem if we so choose to. It's just something where we can get the information to the kids the fastest, and that's what's most important here. It's how we practice, it's, it's how we train them in the system, and it's how we operate in games as well. Oftentimes we snap the ball before the delay of game clock had even rolled back when it was 25 seconds. Like I said, now that we are at the 40 second clock here, uh, there are times where we actually can snap the ball before the chains have even moved. And that really hasn't, hasn't really deterred us from this system. Like I said, it actually has probably enhanced it to some degree. Uh, like I said, most people now are going to be going to the 42nd clock. It seems that the NF NFHS is going to adopt that nationwide here after some of the pilot states have given their feedback. And it looks like we're all going to be going to this. So I think the big message on this is for those of you that are up tempo, don't worry too much about the change here. I really do think it's something that, that after you get into that comfort zone with how the pace of the game is changing from 25 to 40 seconds, you're really going to be able to enjoy that. Uh, we do change situationally, like I said, controlling that clock then. We have a lot of different ways that we go about this. We can obviously go at our, our up-tempo speed and really keep moving rapidly or as fast as we choose to with that ball being constantly spotted and put down. Uh, there are some other ways that we go about this. We have a check with me system that's usually tied to a freeze play where we try to get the team to jump off sides with a dead count. And then everyone will look over to the sideline and we will give them then a live play. That's just number one, trying to get a free five yards, but there are times in the game where you maybe want to change that pace a little bit from breakneck speed to something a little bit slower. And again, you can occasionally get a free five out of that if they jump off sides with that dead call. So we have a check with me system. We also have a hold phase where we will literally just put our hands up to the kids and tell them to just hold and wait. Uh, depending upon, again, the scenario, it's your choice as a head coach or a coordinator, uh, how rapidly you would like to move and what that situation may call for. Maybe you don't want the offense on the other side of the field to have the ball back. You're looking at a, an under two minute scenario. You're close to the end zone, maybe in the red zone there, and you want to slow things down and eat up a little bit more clock, maybe kick a last second field goal, delay that potential touchdown. So we also have a hold system where we will literally just put our hands up to the kids. And that means just get to where you're supposed to be near the line of scrimmage. And we're going to hold here and wait. Uh, and burn a little bit of clock up or whatever it might be. Maybe we just want to hold and we're going to call a timeout with one second left on the clock and, and just eat the full 40 seconds up. There's lots of different reasons that, that you can do that, but we have some choices here. It doesn't have to be full speed all the time. I think it's a common misconception. Uh, how do you change the pace of play? We simply just don't call a play in. You know, the kids can't run a play without a play. So we can manipulate that. And then the final one, like I said, is our freeze, where we'll call a dead play, try to get our free five. That's often tagged into a check with me. Um, maybe it's, it's not. We might even give two freeze plays in a row, potentially. Uh, that's up to you to use. But we will just call in a dead play, and the ball won't be snapped. So the big piece here is this is something that we train for. And I'm going to get more into that later on as we, as we go through this program, again, from top to bottom. But 
This is what we train and we condition for. It's how we practice. It's how we do all of our install stuff as we go through our spring and summer. It's not just something that we only do on game night. It takes a lot of time and a lot of commitment to get this down, but it has been something great for us uh, to be able to use the up-tempo, no-huddle system and style to wear our opponents down and use our conditioning and discipline to our advantage. So why do we do it? Like I said earlier on, we're trying to wear you down. A lot of football games really come down to the third and the fourth quarter. We have been fortunate here that we've been able to get out to a lot of early leads in games and, and wear teams down a lot faster than, than maybe we had expected to. But our level of conditioning, the preparedness that our kids have in this system, and again, how we do this on a daily basis from Monday through Thursday is really what sets us up for tremendous success then on that Friday night. We're trying to stress a defense mentally and physically. We want to see how well prepared you are. With very little downtime between plays, most defenses have to keep their play calls very simple and very straightforward because if they don't, there's a lot of mistakes that are going to be made. At the end of the day, these are high school kids that are out there playing on both sides of the ball. They are going to be mistake prone. We're trying to see if we can force you into mistakes by being too complex or the speed of the system is going to make it too hard for your kids to execute properly in that short period of time. So we're really looking to see how physically and mentally prepared you are for this game and try to exploit some of the deficiencies that may present themselves when those high school kids that are out there on that field start to make mistakes because of the rapid pace that we're moving at. Establishing that inside zone is also a big part of what we do. We're trying to force you to commit extra players to the box. Sometimes that's a very simple thing. Sometimes the teams get very creative on that. But we're trying to see if we can get you to bring extra players in there and then allow the perimeter athletes in space to be able to do their thing and create explosive plays in the passing game. An extra player in the box means that we've gained an advantage somewhere else. If you're not willing to do that, then we should be able to win the numbers game on the inside and have a great opportunity to continue to run our inside zone or our running plays for that week. In the event that you do bring a seventh or potentially eighth player down in the box based on formation, we now have one-on-one -on -one matchups on the perimeter that we're going to start coming after. So again, everything runs off of that inside zone play for us. And then how it is that you plan to prevent and attack that with your defense is where we start to branch off and create opportunities for our offense here. We do use a lot of formations in general. We have roughly 20 in the playbook. Now on a weekly basis, we don't use anywhere near that many. We may carry three or four, we may carry eight to 10, uh, but we do have the ability to hop in and out of a lot of different formations and we'll cover those later on and, and be able to exploit again, some of the things that maybe you don't do very well or don't line up too well, come after mismatches that might be presented by some of the formations that we use. Again, on film, you may see us in a game use eight to 10 on tape and then the net when we play you we only use three or four of those and it can really add up then in total to the amount of preparation that teams have to get into when they go to play us so why do we do this number one it fits our personnel we wouldn't do it if it didn't we do have a lot of linebacker receiver defensive back tight end type kids in most years we oftentimes don't have a ton of large offensive linemen uh, so some of the more pro style or power type things are not going to be great for us. Um, we have been blessed to have a couple years with some pretty good size offensive linemen, but I think the beauty of, of the inside and the outside zone stuff is you don't need to have overwhelmingly large offensive linemen. And so that's been good for us consistency wise to be able to use this system and then have more skill or big skill type players out on the perimeter that can get the ball in their hands. We change almost nothing from week to week in regards to our actual blocking schemes and our rules and our discipline here. We keep things very simple and very standard for our kids. And we really work a lot within the same blocking schemes and system on a daily and weekly basis to keep that familiar for our guys. Our route concepts are very simple to, to memorize and to understand. Um, we're looking to, again, come after your players and see how well prepared you've made them and stress them, make you adjust to multiple formations quickly, understand all the things that we can run from those formations and what's going to be able to hurt them, as well as line up and then execute your assignment well. So we're really trying to ramp up that mental preparation side on, on the opponent in regards to all the things that we can do. <clears throat> and then lastly, 
really what the key to this whole thing is, and I think where we have probably been best at, is what we call simplistic complexity. Uh, our system externally looks like it's very difficult to defend, but truthfully, we really only run a very small set of formations and a very small set of plays on a weekly basis. We just execute those things tremendously, tremendously well. And when we find a formation that you aren't doing very well against, or maybe on tape, we think that you don't line up very well to that just in general, or maybe you don't line up well to that as far as personnel is concerned and you've created your own mismatches on film for us to see, we're going to do what we call make you bleed. And I, I picked this up at a clinic years and years ago, listening to somebody else talk about this, this whole bleed aspect of when you find a formation that the opponent is not properly lining themselves up to, or in the midst of a game, you find out that they're not lining themselves up to a formation very well, we're not going to come out of that until you fix the problem. And we're going to slowly bleed you out until there's nothing left. And at that point in time, usually the game is, is pretty much in hand because our offense has been so successful. So uh, maybe the plan is to have seven or eight formations in that game that we want to come at you with. And we come out early in the first quarter and there's one formation that you are not handling very well. We're going to stay in that and continue to come after you until you fix the problems of it. It's our job to score points and move the football uh, efficiently and protect the football. It's your job to stop us. And if you're not lining up very well to one particular formation, there's no reason for us to change things and come out of that until you fix it. So that's really one of the keys to what we do is we're going to try to expose you with that formation or that play that you're not responding well to. And we're going to stay with that until, again, that problem has been fixed. So um, not many teams that we see use the formations that we do. A lot more teams around here now are starting to get into the spread. You're seeing a lot more of the, of the RPO type stuff on a weekly basis. But we still do have a lot of teams in our conference and the teams that we play in general that are going to be uh, pro style, uh, wishbone, a wing tee, uh, some run and shoot, some things like that. So it is a little difficult from time to time for us to, to kind of visualize how you may line up to a specific, specific formation uh, based upon all the things that, that we get in film and when we trade. Um, but that also is what makes my, my previous statement really important. When you come out there on a Friday night and there might be a little bit of uncertainty as far as how the opponent's going to line up, processing how they are lining up to those things and then really focusing in on that one or two formations that they're not doing a great job with is again what I think has made our offense really good over the years because we don't try to get very flashy with a lot of that stuff. Um, if you're not doing something well, we're going to continue to come after that and maybe it's something we prepared for, maybe it isn't, but once we find it, we're going to continue to come after it. Lastly, uh, again, they're high school kids. And at the end of the day, they're the ones that have to play the game and they're the ones that have to execute on the field. And most importantly, they're the ones that have to communicate. So if there are checks in your system on defense, if there are different things that, that you have installed for that week when you come to play us and those things need to be done, we're going to stress that communication level and see how well prepared your kids are in that aspect. If they're supposed to have a certain check for a certain formation, we want to see what those checks are and see if they can execute them at a rapid pace. Oftentimes, especially at the high school level, kids are going to struggle with alignment, assignment, and communication. Um, and, and the simpler that we can make defenses through our, our tempo is going to be better and more beneficial for us. Again, oftentimes, the more complex that teams make things, the more breakdowns you have in that assignment, alignment, and execution, communication, and that then becomes another huge advantage for our offense. So that's really what we're looking for here is trying to make you create mistakes for us through our speed, through our formations, the tempo, and the constant execution of very simple things on our end, trying to make you do too much to stop us.